Well, thank you, Glenn. And, uh, welcome to the class of 2020. <laughs> By the way, you don't all have to go into ophthalmology. And welcome to you in the audience, all the family and friends of these graduates. This is traditionally the beginning of the academic year and the beginning of a career in medicine. And as Glenn already described, is an important first step now in virtually every medical school in the world. As I was preparing for the white coat speech today, I've been to many white coat speeches. In fact, I actually gave the white coat address at my former institution. And then about two weeks later, I accepted the position here <coughs> during the white coat ceremony last year. And I could have given a variety of different talks, but for today's uh, discussion, I actually took a, a clue from Dr. Fred Jacobs, a very senior faculty member at our institution, who suggested that instead of a talk, I tell you a few stories. So today I'm going to tell you the story of three patients. Three patients that created me as the physician that is addressing you today. Now, as is true with all stories, you often need a little preamble to understand the message of the story. So my first patient story takes place in Boston, at, as you heard in the introduction, at the Massachusetts General Hospital, where I was an intern. Now, a little of the background, I graduated from Case Western Reserve University in Cleveland, Ohio, a very old medical school, so old that it was created when Western Reserve Ohio was the Western Reserve of the state of Connecticut, to give you an idea how old that school is. But there had never been a house officer in the school, uh, in the Department of Medicine of the Mass General from my medical school. Now, I think it'd be fair to say that in 1970, internal medicine training at the Mass General was probably the most competitive residency in that field in the country. And when I arrived in Boston, it was a slightly bit intimidating. At least half of all the house officers had gone to Harvard undergraduate school and Harvard Medical School. Those of us that hadn't done that all referred to that as Preparation H, but uh, that was probably not appreciated by those students. Uh, the other half of the uh, interns in my class were the number one students at a variety of highly prestigious institutions, Johns Hopkins, Columbia, Duke, et cetera. And uh, I was the only one from that Western school at Case Western Reserve in Ohio. I was similarly intimidated by the fact that I learned that 15 of the 16 all had PhDs. I was the one that didn't. Uh, one of my interns had uh, recently discovered helper T cells and suppressor T cells, fellow inter interns, and one had recently described calcium channels, which turned out to be a rather important uh, topic in medicine. So I just tried very hard not to embarrass myself as the one kid from Ohio and prayed that they would someday take another student from my school. Well, it was about two months into my internship, and. Uh, I should give you somewhat of the setting of training in the 70s. The good news for you parents in the audience, this has changed a lot in the last four decades, but we had virtually no supervision. We were on three-person teams, two interns and a junior resident, which meant at night the, quote, supervising resident was home sleeping. Uh, so I was on call late at night, about 2.30, and I got a phone call from the emergency room admitting me Mr. Manillo, who was my first patient. Now, the admitting house officer told me, well, I just, we just finished making four admissions to the intensive care unit. All the beds are full. They're up there crazy up there taking care of these very sick patients. And we have this patient down here that's rather sick. But because we know you're interested in going into infectious disease, we decided that we we're going to admit uh, this patient to the floor to you. And uh, they uh, subsequently described Mr. Manello. Now, Mr. Manello was an elderly Italian gentleman who lived in the north end of Boston, very close to the Mass General. And he had a lot of complicated problems. He drank too much, he smoked too much, he had diabetes, he had heart problems, uh, and he was probably infected. He had a high fever, he had a high white count, looks like he had pneumonia, probably had a urinary tract infection. And uh, I went down to the emergency room and wheeled him up to the Bullfinch building, which uh, was where we saw our patients. It, at the time, was the oldest building still in use as a hospital built in 1830 and the male ward had 32 beds around a space about the size of a small basketball court with patients and I began to take care of Mr. Manila. Now he was fairly sick. 
And I, in those days, there was two nurses on that uh, particular ward and no ancillary uh, help. You started all the IVs, you had, needed an x-ray, you wheeled them to x-ray. If you started IVs, you mixed them up yourself. You started antibiotics, you mixed them up yourself. And I proceeded to do all those things. And, uh, you know, he wasn't looking so great. And about 4 o'clock in the morning, he really didn't look very well. And, uh, you know, I thought about what to do. I added another antibiotic. I sat next to his bed, and I took his blood pressure myself and adjusted the fluids. I put in a Foley catheter. And fortunately, about 6 or 7 o'clock in the morning, Mr. Manello looked like he was doing a bit better. And by the time my fellow house officers came in, he was looking a lot better. And by about 9 o'clock in the morning, I think he'd turned the corner and looks like, uh, you know, he was going to do okay. Well, I mentioned that we didn't do much supervision, and in fact, we would present one interesting case to our attending each night we were on call. Heaven knows what we did with the other 10 or 15 that we admitted. But I, of course, uh, wanted to present Mr. Manillo that had occupied most of my night. And it turned out my regular attending wasn't going to be there. Instead, my attending was the chief resident, a man named Gary Skulnick, who in those days had, as was true of the chief residents, the Mass General, was a PGY-7. That meant that he had completed all of his internal medicine training, all of his infectious disease training, and two years at the National Institute of Health, a really smart guy, and he was in infectious disease, of course, the field I was trying to go into. And so I presented this very complicated case to him in morning rounds. We went and saw him, and fortunately, he was looking great by now about 11 o'clock in the morning. And we were through with rounds, and uh, basically the team was breaking up. And Dr. Skulnick said, uh, hey, Dick, could you come over here? I want to talk to you for a minute. And Gary basically turned to me and said, you know, Dick, you're a really bright guy. You're going to have a promising future in infectious disease. But I got the distinct impression as you presented the case that it, you cared more about what your fellow house officers thought about this, that you were going to be the stone wall. You're going to protect the intensive care unit. And you know, Mr. Manillo might have done a lot worse in the middle of that night because you still left him on the floor and you cared for him. Now, what's often true in medicine is the truth is often hard to hear. But Gary was right. And I never forgot that event. So Mr. Manello not only taught me an important lesson in the caring for patients, but I have repeated that story innumerable times as an attending on the floors whenever I felt that the house staff or medical student teams we're thinking about the wrong things. Because when all is said and done, no matter how unpopular, no matter how you might appear, you've got to do what's best for your patient. Now the second patient is another patient I took care of at the Mass General, Miss Ella Mae Robinson. Now Miss Robinson was a very interesting lady. She was an elderly <clears throat> black female school teacher, had retired for over 20 years, and she had very severe aortic stenosis. That's a narrowing of the aortic valve, the big valve that exits the heart. It was so severe that you could literally lay your hand on her chest and hear and feel the vibration from the turbulent blood flow that went across that calcific valve. And she was in real distress, short of breath in congestive heart failure. And as I began to take care of her and get her out of that condition, up came in the record room came a stack of charts about a foot high that recapped the story of Miss Robinson. Now, Miss Robinson had been seen by virtually all the medical house staff at the Mass General for the last 15 years, and they had all very accurately diagnosed that she was suffering from calcific aortic stenosis of the elderly, that she needed her heart valve replaced, and that they had eloquently explained all of that to the patient, and she had steadfastly refused. And so every one of those admissions ended with medical management, home, and then subsequent readmission for congestive heart failure. And I was just one more house officer in that trail, except the house officer that had taken care of her last had already left, and so now she was my patient. Well, I took care of Miss Robinson, and we got her in better shape, and again presented the argument that she should have that heart valve taken out <clears throat> and she again steadfastly refused and she began to appear either in my clinic 
or more frequently being readmitted to the hospital with congestive heart failure. And this cycle was going on and on as I took care of her during my first year as a resident. Now, I, I actually got to know Ms. Robinson fairly well during that time, particularly in the times when she was in the intensive care unit or when she was on the floor and I was caring for her. And I slowly began to try to understand why a bright woman, school teacher for over 40 years, who clearly knew and could practically feel the problem, wouldn't accept the fact that she needed open heart surgery. She eventually told me that, that she was just so afraid that she just couldn't face the possibility of having that surgery. She had moved to Boston from the South when she was relatively young. She had no family left. She had retired 20 years before, and all of her family and friends and co-workers had either moved away or retired. She was all by herself, and she was scared to death to have that operation. So we talked more about, you know, what we could do about doing that. And I asked her, I said, you know, if there was somebody that would go through this with you, how would you feel about having this operation? What if, what if there was somebody with you and, you know, when they put you to sleep and with you when they woke you up again and with you as you basically recovered from the surgery, do you think that uh, that would be a little less scary? And she felt that was the case. So one day, Miss Robinson and I went into that hospital and we admitted ourselves onto the surgery service. I saw her every day, twice a day, not a big deal. I virtually lived in the hospital every time I came in and every time I went out. I was with her when they induced anesthesia. I was with her in the operating room. And when she woke up from anesthesia, I was there holding her hand when she was still intubated and got her through rehabilitation. And ultimately, she did very well, lived for another 12 years with that prostatic aortic valve. <clears throat> Now, my wife Jackie and I remember Miss Robinson to this day in part because on our bed in our summer home in Vermont, we have an afghan that she knitted me during her recovery. It is Miss Robinson that told me a whole lot more about caring for patients because there wasn't a problem in figuring out what was wrong or what the evidence-based solution to the problem was. Miss Robinson just needed a friend. And if there wasn't any other friend around, that friend had to be me. Now the last story of the last patient is probably the hardest for me because that's the patient Dr. Glenn A. Oles. <clears throat> now you might imagine from that name that that was my father. Now my father was a pretty interesting guy. He was a Methodist minister. Actually he was a college president most of his life. <clears throat> and he had a pretty bad medical history. Sorry to say, because of course he's my father. And he had a rather bad cardiovascular history. He was the only male in the Olds family to live to the age of 65. They had all died previously of heart disease. And he had two major open heart surgeries. He had had coronary bypass surgery. And then he had an aortic dissection of the first part of the aorta. That's the big tube coming out of the aortic valve. And had it replaced at the Cleveland Clinic. And this was a very difficult operation because he'd had previous surgery in this area. And about 14 hours into the operation, that surgeon didn't think he could make it through the subsequent six hours it would take to replace that valve, and he decided to try to save the valve. And it worked for about eight years, but about eight years later, that valve began to fail. And at this point, he had too many complicated medical problems to actually replace that valve. And so he was basically in a situation with almost continuous congestive heart failure from a, in this case, aortic insufficiency. Now, he's a very complicated to manage such a patient with medical management, and he had some very good doctors taking care of him, and he was on a lot of complicated medicines. <clears throat> and eventually, uh, it became so complicated that his son, the doctor, uh, began adjusting his medicines uh, based on a daily basis, based on his weight, based on what his blood pressure was, based on how he was breathing, et cetera. And I was keeping this up for about six months, and I knew he was getting worse, so I flew out to Oregon. I lived on the East Coast at the time. And as soon as I walked in the door, it was clear he was doing poorly. I called 911. We went to the emergency room, got him back on his feet, and I decided to stay that night in his uh, patient bedroom, you know, to see how he's doing, making sure he's doing okay. During that night, my father turned to me and he said, you know, Dick, you know, you're a great doctor. I'm so proud of you, but I need you to quit working so hard to keep me alive. I just don't like living this way. <clears throat> 
I'm not afraid of dying, but I hate being short all, uh, of breath. I hate coming to the hospital all the time. Can't I just go away peacefully at home? That's what I want. And that's not what's been happening. So we discharged him home to hospice in his home, very close to where the Olds family actually uh, came to Oregon in the 1850s. And he passed away eight days later looking at Mount Hood at night with his family around him. And what's the point of that story? Is I'd like to think that if that was an ordinary patient, I would have been more sensitive to what really he wanted at the end, but he was my father. And this is the reason that doctors shouldn't take care of their loved ones, and one of the reasons why you have to be careful when you get too close emotionally to the patients you care for, because you have a tendency to try to do what you think the patient wants, what you would do in that circumstance, and forget that you have to listen to the patient and try to do what the patient wants with life. And that's a hard lesson to have learned fairly late in my professional career, and hopefully is a lesson that all of you can learn at the beginning. So three simple stories. I could have given you virtually a thousand stories of patients that have influenced me as a physician. Perhaps I could have told you stories about where I made a brilliant diagnosis that nobody thought of. I could have told you a story how I saved someone's life and uh, they for, were ever grateful for the fact that I did something that saved them. But those are not the events that make you a real doctor. The faculty are the ones that you'll learn all about. How the body works, how it goes wrong in disease, how to make a diagnosis, what's the best way to treat conditions. But it's your patients, as Glenn had said earlier, that teach you the art of medicine. And you have to be open to that, you have to listen to it, and you have to learn from the hard lessons, from the mistakes that you will make in the management of your patients. And if you do that, you will all become great physicians. So class of 2020, welcome to what I consider the noble profession of medicine. Thank you.